Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking MLS craziness, Bale, Cucho, Suarez, Bestia, Castellanos, Miami, Louis, uh, Burhalter, White Claw, EPL Draft, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday, July 18th in the year 2022? I am doing well. I have put on a hat. That was my big wardrobe change. You, meanwhile, look completely different than you looked the last time I saw you. Yes, a few orders of business here. Um, so we have been in early here. When I say here, I mean the, uh, the studio, uh, cranking out content for you. Uh, so this week, if all goes <laughs> as planned, uh, you will be listening to this, which will appear in your feed on Tuesday. On Wednesday, a special, special State of the Union podcast in which we celebrate being a year out from the Women's World Cup will appear in your feed. Myself and David Mossy welcome our special guest, Ali Wagner, and we get into de in depth about the U.S. Women's National Team and this incredible World Cup that is coming uh, next summer. So definitely look uh, look for that. And then on Thursday, in your feed, you will find a special special interview with the one and only Greg Berhalter, the head coach of the U.S. Men's National Team, that we will be recording uh, here hopefully in the next uh, twenty four hours. So look for all of that. But since we are recording a couple times today. I decided to change a little bit uh, of the wardrobe. I wore more of a suit for our Women's World Cup preview. And now I'm back to much more of my regular attire for our regular show. You, your change was to put a hat on. <laughs> I love it, though. I love it. I love it. Uh, what's uh, what's going on, my friend? Anything interesting happened in the, uh, last week here? Well, first off, we just had a Game of Thrones moment. Uh, I had a bottle of water, uh, and I didn't, I didn't know I was not allowed to have that on camera. So I was told to put that away. Uh, ah, yes. The coffee cup, the, the right? Coffee See, cup I know this. Khaleesi. I know these uh, cultural references. The, uh, the Game of Thrones spinoff is coming, my friend. Everybody's excited about that. From a television standpoint, I have my regular stuff going on tonight. Another episode of Better Call Saul. The final batch got off to an incredible start last week. And I have another episode in my true crime doc, Mind Over Murder. Right. And when I'm is waiting. that over? How many more episodes? Two more to go. Two more. Okay. Uh, but I want to talk to you, my friend, because you dropped a pretty big text on me. Uh, is it true that you have started binging Peaky Blinders? Yes, this this will be the news. Uh, and I know there's people out there that fast forward uh, this. And go ahead, you can do that. That's no problem. Uh, so this will be the news when it comes to what we are watching. I have finally, as everybody knows, uh, I only watch it when a show is complete. And so I have not only gotten into Peaky Blinders here, but I am into the sixth season. I, I I did not stop. And I want to make sure people understand, it's not necessarily that I like something that I will binge it. I would just have to binge it and I have to get to start to finish, which is what I do. And I do recognize that in a certain way, I'm not doing it justice, whether it's Peaky Blinders or anything else, because there is a part of me that recognizes that digesting it week after week can be a different type of experience than, than binging it. Uh, I have my rules and they're, they're steadfast, as you know, and so that's what I do. The, the, the Peaky Blinders phenomenon and, and fad over the last uh, decade, it, it, it had come to my attention, obviously. People were talking about it. I remember everyone from Kate Abdo on, on set you know, screaming and yelling about this and others. And I was, so I was not oblivious to the fact that this show was going on, but like Game of Thrones or anything else uh, or Sopranos, I, I needed to wait till it was done and therefore uh, available to me to binge. So I'm almost done. I got a few episodes left in, uh, um, in season six. Having said that, I, I have a pretty good idea of what this is right now. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say I love it. I really, really like it, okay? And I like it more than The Sopranos. And the only reason I bring up The Sopranos is it's legendary, my distaste for The Sopranos. And it, it was largely based on the fact that I couldn't find anything redeeming in anybody in that show other than, uh, what was her name? Menelark Lemon. Uh, 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 what's, what, what was the daughter's name? Meadow. 
Metal, so <laughs> Metal Lark. I, thought, I don't know why I called her metal, metal Lark. But anyway, she had a little bit of a demon, but nobody else did. Um, to a certain extent, there is a lot of that, that at play when it comes to Peaky Blinders for those that have, uh, that have watched it. Um, but there is much more humanity, if you will. And the, um, you know, the, uh, the time and the era is also very interesting to me and what that was, what it wasn't. I think they did an, do an incredible job. And look, I'm not saying anything new that people haven't said before in terms of the music uh, and the way that they used modern music to depict this, you know, old ancient type of uh, setting. Uh, some of it, look, I know whenever you're watching a movie or, or a show, you have to suspend some belief in order to have this happen. I do think when you see things like this that kind of started out and they hit the jackpot in popularity, you can see how the writing room probably morphed and changed and went up and, and down and the arcs that either were intended or unintended as they go on and even, um, you know, deaths of cast members and all that kind of stuff that applies to uh, Peaky Blinders. In general, I, I, I love it. I would recommend it to anybody. I do watch with subtitles, but I watch with subtitles no matter what. So it works out. Uh, it, it works out. It works out great. That any of the main characters are still alive by season six requires some suspended belief. But you know, you want to. You, you want your uh, people. Uh, people there. And like a lot of good things, there's also an element of you never know who is going to be around come next episode and or next season. Well, particularly the Tom Hardy character, Alfie Solomon. Boy, they keep figuring out contrived ways to keep him alive. Huh? <laughs> and, and it's it's interesting because I didn't know all the characters' names, and I would see this Alfie Solomon name kind of pop up. You'd see it on Twitter or whatever like that. And so it didn't register to me. Obviously it registered me now and I can see why he resonated. I can see why that character was so uh, impactful when it comes to the show. I will say on The Sopranos, uh, we did lose last week the actor who played Paulie Walnuts yep. passed away. So rest Re in peace. Rest in peace to, uh, to him. But anyway, so I, by the time we talk next week, I will have binged the entire uh, six seasons of Peaky, Peaky Blinders. And the amount of drinking in every single scene and smoking, and let's be honest, I mean, the uh, Thomas, right? The, the lead, the, the Thomas lead. Shelby. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he does everything that moves. Let's be honest. I mean, it's, if there is a woman on the show, chances are you're going to see a scene with him in, in, in a bed somewhere. Uh, and so he's a, another character that's nuts. Uh, amongst lots of characters that are uh, that are nuts there. So anyway, I uh, uh, I am a Peaky Binders, uh, not fanatic, but definite supporter. Excellent. Nice. Yes. Uh, anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right, ready uh, to light this candle? Let's do it. All right, let's light this candle. And it's not going to be as big a candle as we have done in the past. We're going to try to get through this a little bit uh, quicker today. But there is plenty of go uh, goings on when it comes to the uh, the soccer world. We had a hell of a week when it comes to Major League Soccer uh, that included rivalry week. And just in general, the games would be good, but that they were rivalries made them that much more special. I think it lived up to a certain extent to the hype out there. Where would you like to start when it comes to all of these different games and scores and storylines? Uh, we're going to start with the LA teams for a change. Um, <laughs> because the LA Galaxy are, are in a Free crisis, fall. my friend. Free yes. fall. The latest defeat uh, was a 2-0 loss to Colorado. Derek Williams gave a stinging interview afterwards saying that everybody's out for themselves. They're not listening to the coach's game plans. Uh, they are still clinging to that final playoff spot in the West. Had there been a winner in the Portland-Vancouver game, that team would have surpassed him, but that game finished 1-1. So um, nevertheless, uh, this is not trending in the right direction. I know we had Kobe Jones uh, in studio on Sunday. He was making the case that once Chicharito and Delgado get back in the lineup, he still thinks they'll be okay. They'll make the playoffs. You are not so sure. I am not so sure that they make the playoffs. To your point, they are trending the wrong way. I think Kobe believes that there, those reinforcements are going to get them back. Uh, you mentioned you know, Derek's comments after the game. <laughs> it was kind of funny because he said he felt bad for the staff. Uh, and <laughs> my point was, well, feel bad for the fans because they have to watch this crap. 
and they have to pay for this, this crap, and they have higher expectations. And there's a reason why we talk about the LA Galaxy. The LA Galaxy are, are a story as much as when they are bad and lose as when they win, and that's what super clubs are. That's just the reality. And don't think for a second that there aren't plenty that are dancing on the LA Galaxy grave, if you will, right now. They're not completely dead and buried, but the misfortune right now and the failure right now of the LA Galaxy is being celebrated in certain circles. And that's that comes with the territory when you are a big club like this that falls on hard times. I don't see it necessarily getting uh, getting getting any be uh, any better. And it's Greg Vanny's job to fix this, to find a way to fix it. If there are problems internally when it comes to you know, the attitude or carrying out assignments, like any coach, no, nobody... Nobody's going to care from the outside why it's happening. Your job is to fix it. And I do believe, believe Greg Vanny recognizes that and has the capacity and the tools to fix something like that. But, you know, we've seen this is not a good time to be trending down. This is when you start revving up for that final push in a season that we also know is going to be shorter in terms of when it ends this year. So you got to get hot at the right time in Major League Soccer, but it... and. For what applies to LA Galaxy or anybody else, this is not a time to be incredibly cold in what you're doing, especially you mentioned them hanging on to that seventh place. I mean, I guess the good news is, is everybody is bunched up. I mean, when you talk about LAFC at the top at 42 points, LA at 27. So you, you leave out LAFC and Austin at the 40 in, in the forties, but then between Salt Lake at number three at 33 points, and then all the way down to, I mean, I mean, you'd have to go to like Colorado at 12 points, uh, uh, 12th place at 24 points. It's all bunched. It's all going to change. It is going to be this wonderful musical chairs type of affair. The music is going to stop. I don't think that the Galaxy are going to have a chair, but if, if they are, they're going to have to drastically change and right quick. Well, the saving grace for them right now is that Seattle have lost three in a row and are still below the playoff line. We'll go there next. We can talk LAFC in a minute, but... Um, Seattle has never missed the playoffs. I think, gun to our heads, we'd all still expect them to, to make it again. We keep but, saying that, though. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, are they going to recover their best form at any point the remainder of this season? I'm starting to have doubts about that. They miss Juan Pablo more than I imagined. Obed Vargas out as well. Rui Diaz battling injuries this season. And is there a chance that they figure out a way to make the playoffs to preserve that streak, but that they're not really a big threat to win MLS Cup this year? Or you, you think that's uh, jumping the gun on that? You still think they might I recapture think, their best form? I think that they open. struggle through and they make the playoffs. And then, as we all know, the playoffs sometimes is a rejuvenating moment. And your, your form, if you will, leading up to it doesn't always translate to what happens in the playoffs. And I think, and I'm not saying that Seattle is going to rely on that. That's just from, a, from afar how I see this playing out, where they are going to just do it a very different way than they have done in the past. Now, by the way, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility for Seattle to go on a run. We have actually seen that in previous uh, seasons. Far be it from me to doubt a team that has been so consistently successful in making the playoffs or to doubt a coach in Brian Schmetzer who has been so good. Eventually, the well runs dry, right? And... Is this the moment when that well is running dry? Even a couple of pieces, and you mentioned Vargas and uh, and, and uh, Jao Paulo and you know those types of players, and you start taking some pieces out, and it can be problematic. I didn't think that the Concacaf Champions League success <laughs> was going to be a, a poison chalice, if you will, for Seattle in the way that it it seems to have been. And I'm sure if the Seattle folks were here, whether it's Brian Spencer or any of the players, they'd say, "Well, it has nothing to do with Concacaf Champions League. We've moved on from that." But but you can't you can't separate this season from CONCACAF Champions League and all of the eggs that were put in that basket and ultimately hatched in a beautiful way for them. Having a moment to celebrate, a historic moment to celebrate relative to not only your club, but to your league and even beyond that to the sport in qualifying for the uh, the Club World Cup. Yeah, I mean, it. It, is, it seems to have decimated this team in terms of their ability to function as a soccer team. Uh, LAFC, meanwhile, uh, keep rolling. They won 2 on away to Nashville. Uh, Chiellini started, played the first 60 minutes, and then about 10 minutes after he subbed off, Gareth Bale subbed on, so he played about the last 20. 
Um, I will say, when Bale was on the field, it looked a little awkward. He came on for Arango. Uh, Vela uh, slid to that center forward spot. I know it's only <laughs> part of one game, but I do have some question marks there. And I keep wondering, is Arango really going to be the sacrificial lamb here? Because he scored again. He's up to eight goals this season, had 14 and 17 games last year. I remain perplexed at the way some people seem ready to cast him aside to try to make this Bale-Vela thing work, but we'll see how it goes. How, how do you not start Arango? I mean, that, how do you... How do you change anything that's going on right now from uh, from a uh, a top three or a three up top type of perspective? I mean, I just don't I, I can't see that happen. Now these are all champagne problems. These are all good problems for Steve Tarundolo to have, but he's they are of their own making. They recognize that again, to use the musical chairs thing, somebody's not going to have a seat. And that somebody is going to be really good. And they will say, yeah, but we can bring that person off the bench and that wonderful depth and all that kind of stuff. But it it doesn't matter that a big name uh, or a high paid player takes your spot. It doesn't make it feel any better. And a player, it, that can be a cancer. That can be a problem, not just for the individual player, but for the message that it sends. And, you know, for all the sexy type of things that LAFC has done and the super clubbish type of behavior, which I love, there still has to be a recognition internally that the reason why you are getting this, this attention, yes, is relative to how sexy a name you are, where you've come from, the money that you're getting, but you got to perform. And you know, we're already seeing them, you know, Kalini talking about the, the heat. Well, welcome to MLS, all right? All it took was a look on your app and you could have figured, you could have figured that out. I do worry about Kalini, uh, Kalini in the back in terms of dealing with some of the speed and just what Major League Soccer is. Uh, and you mentioned bail. Uh, but to have all of these problems, and I'll call them problems, but challenges, shall we call them, and to still win, and to still win on the road, and to still win an environment where Nashville is, for me, one of the good teams in the league, maybe not ultimately elite, but one of the good teams, bordering on great teams, in a packed house. And by the way, that house is 30,000, uh, because we know that's the soccer-specific stadium that they built over there. That's a good result. It is a really good result on the road, and you introduce these players. So Steve Torundo, Steve Torundo and company keep pressing the right buck, uh, the buttons uh, for this uh, this LAFC team. They are atop the supporter showed race one point above Austin, who drew 1-1 away to Dallas. NYCFC with a nice win, 1-0 away to the Red Bulls. Their first win over the Red Bulls at Red Bull Arena since 2017. Uh, Castellanos got the only goal. But uh, the body language afterwards seemed to indicate that this was his farewell. And sure enough, there's news today. It looks like he's going to be bought by the City Football Group and loaned to Girona, which is a newly promoted team in Spain. I have some issues with that. Uh, this City Football Group has become the bane of my existence because <laughs> they've bought all these young Brazilian players right. in recent years. And the problem is the other European clubs in their portfolio besides Manchester City are terrible. It's Lomel SK, it's Girona, it's our favorite club, Tra <laughs> in Liga. And so, you know, those are clubs that if, if they showed up to buy these players, they would never go there. But somehow, if it's done through City Football Group, it gives it this imprimatur of being a savvy career move. And all these guys think they're auditioning for Manchester City. But wake me up when a guy goes from Girona to Manchester City. So, I don't know. Castellanos, I think, could have done better than this. But I guess they didn't get a good enough offer in the open market. So, this is going to be the solution of City Football Group buying him and then loaning him to one of their other clubs. I don't love it. How do you feel well, about this? Well, and also keep in mind, you remember when um, Tyler Adams was uh, was bought by, uh, where, did he, where, did he, where he went to, uh, Salzburg? Leipzig. Leipzig. Leipzig, right? So when it happens in the family, because a lot of the talk about Castellanos was, are they going to get the rumored 15 million or whatever it ends up uh, being that they wanted? So because City Group is buying this player and it's, in the family, are they going to get a discount? Is there, are they, are they okay taking the value because, or, or the diminished value if there is, or the discount that you get because it's within the, within the family and it's all going back to the same thing, uh, the same thing anyway. I mean, I don't, Pastranos doesn't, doesn't care because he's going to get paid either way, but I don't, they're not the bane of my existence. I actually can respect and like what they are, what they are doing. But from, from his perspective, I mean, When's the next time we're going to care or talk about Castellanos? Unless he just lights it up and scores a bunch of goals in uh, in La Liga right now. So he's kind of 
Is this an up, a, a upward move? Yeah, I guess getting your feet in Europe in and of itself for a lot of players is already a step forward uh, from uh, from where they are. The problem for NYCFC is how do you replace him, regardless of what the money is? Well, Luis Aguilar and I are on the same page because he put uh, Luis Suarez uh, and the fact that he's currently weighing five or six offers from MLS right below that NYCFC story. That's the team that's kind of been popping in my head as far as Suarez and MLS if he were to make that move because they have this large South American contingent. It's New York. Uh, does that make any sense to you? Luis Suarez, perhaps? As, uh, 2022 Luis Suarez replacing Castellanos? That's a downgrade. That's, that's, that's a problem. No, that doesn't make any sense. To, well, I mean, does it make sense? I, I mean, from I, I guess that could, it could happen. Yeah, but that's what we're doing? I think that'd be phenomenal. Why? Well, we discussed this when he was rumored to be going to River Plate. I guess I seem to be higher on Luis Suarez and what he is in the year but 2022. Relative to Tate Castellanos. And, the, and what, because first off, first off, keep in mind that when it comes to Castellanos, it's not even all about scoring goals. He's an incredible goal scorer, prolific, which is why there's all this attention, but it's, he does so much more. And you think for an, for an instant that Luis Suarez is going to come in and do any, do any of that dirty work and that hard work and that tracking back and that being the first le- line of defense, all that different stuff. Hell no. We'll Ugh. see. We'll see. Now, one club that's really benefiting from adding a South American striker is Columbus. Yep. We did their game uh, on Sunday, FS1. The hell is real derby against Cincinnati. They win 2-0. Cucho Hernandez finds the back of the net again in his first start. That's four and three games for him. Uh, assisted by Zellerayan, who then scored from the penalty spot, ending his long drought. Zellerayan with a goal and five assists in the last three games. So this is as good as as a number nine, number 10 combination I've seen in a while in this league. I mean, those two guys just seem to love playing with each other, have such a good understanding. And, you know, we talked to Caleb Porter and you could tell he had a real skip to his step. Yep. He feels like they, they're going to take off here. And, and I believe it. I think Columbus really has something going on. They there. do. They do. And it w- you could see it. You could see it happening on the field. And while, while New York and the Pigeons, the, New York is blue. And when I say New York, I mean <laughs> New Jersey also and maybe parts of Connecticut, if you will. When it comes to the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio is, is black and gold. And hell is real, lived up t- to the, uh, the hype. It was a fun game. It was rocking there in, uh, uh, in Columbus in that brand new, beautiful stadium that they have. And with the addition of Cucho, th- this is a guy that you can see is already elevating other players. And it's not it's not all about Zellerayan, although that is a huge benefit. It's about everybody. I mean, if you're a center back for Columbus right now and you you look then you say, "I got someone now who, I mean, he scored four goals in two and a half games or whatever if you put it all together in terms of the uh <laughs> the goals to minutes played. It's it's incredible." So, that's a good thing. I remember years ago, some people won't remember this, but there was a, a goal scorer by the name of Carlos Ruiz, El Pescadito, okay? And I'll never forget the moment that he came into the locker room and came on the field. Now, he was a lot younger and hadn't quite been out there in the way that Cucho has, but still, the impact of having a guy on the field that you know more often than not is going to find a way to score goals, that is so valuable, I mean, if I, as a defender, know walking on the field that we're already up 1-0, that, that, that is worth its weight in gold. And by the way, they did pay $10 million rumored uh, for the transfer fee. So, and, and to your point uh, about Caleb Porter and the way that he talked about him, he wanted specifically to mention the fact that one of the reasons why he thinks that this is working and is going to work is because of the position that he's playing in that striker position at that number nine position, which is something in the past in, in teams that he's played for, he has not been given the opportunity. So I think you see him really rejoicing at the fact that he's playing in a position where he thinks he's best at. And then you see everybody around him excited about this guy that has already put the fear of God into now multiple teams in Major League Soccer. Now, on three different occasions during our coverage of Mm -hmm. this Columbus-Cincinnati game, Kobe Jones compared Cucho Hernandez to Romario. (laughs) Um, I've made some phone calls. Kobe will never appear on Fox again. Um, uh, Yeah. I I get it. It's stocky striker, but come on. It's, yeah. I uh, Having at least attempted to mark Romario in the past on, on a, a couple of occasions. I, I can tell you that his 
center of gravity and his shifting of weight um, is very different than than Cucho's. But I I get the comparison that to be in that turn that he had. I don't know if you remember it. He turned at the box and did like a toe poke. Romario did love a good toe poke. Okay, Absolutely. Uh, and he didn't care how the ball went in. He would use whatever part of his part of his body. But that might be a stretch when it comes. Uh, but, but, but maybe the next Joseph Martinez kind of has sure. that feel. Yeah. Exactly. Joseph, that's a that's a really good comparison uh, when it comes to Joseph Martinez, who, by the way, did get on the field, did not start in uh, Atlanta's 1-1 uh, uh, tie there with who, who did they have? Orlando. Orlando, that's right. Crazy ending. Crazy game. Hitting Crazy. The post and stoppage time. Right. And uh, Orlando scored a goal and the goalkeeper was, I don't know what the hell a goalkeeper was doing, but the whistle blew and he was on the other side of the goal and the, the ball went in. It is not the referee's responsibility, all right? to wait for the goalkeeper to say, I am ready. Even though the referee may signal that the free kick is going to be taken on the whistle, the whistle is only there to get things in order. Primarily the, the 10 yards that somebody gets. So this is on the goalkeeper and uh, that complaint. There were some interesting calls, by the way, in, uh, in MLS this week. We're not going to go through them all. I will say in the, in the Cincinnati game, I thought that, that Columbus should have had one maybe two. I know they had one, but they should have had maybe three penalties. And, and there was a play in the first half that you think was exhibit A of why players dive. Exactly. Because in the moment, uh, who was the player? I can't remember the player's name, but, but regardless, I mean, you'll, you'll understand this, whether you saw the game or not, because this does happen. We are, we are hell bent on eradicating diving in the game. And not we, there are those. Okay. I, it's not that big a deal to me. I, I don't, suffer from it the way that others do. Fine. But if you are hell-bent in eradicating diving, this was a case where a player actually played with honor, if you will, and fought through being held and being held back. And every coach, well, not every coach, but most coaches and most players for that matter, will look at that play and in that moment in real time say, go down, go down, go down. And there's a reason why players go down. There's a reason why players embellish. There's a reason why players, embellishing and diving may be different things, but the reason why players, according to some, dive. It is to get the call. But the call is theirs no matter what. And in this instant, you cannot be a little pregnant. Either you were held back or you weren't. And in the age of VAR, when you go and look at it and you can clearly see that this player is being held back, then wh what are we doing here? If that is not a foul, then none of it's a foul. But if it is holding somebody back and you say, well, he just held them back a little. No, again, you can't be a little pregnant. That should be a foul. All right. I'm not saying that I like the game where that is a foul, but if that is on display and we have VAR going on and it does hold a player back. And you are, what in essence you are doing is punishing a player for not actually going down, for not diving. That's where we're at. And that's where my frustration and anger came from. No, I agree. Uh, Inter Miami beat Charlotte 3-2. I'm curious what you think of this. Um, Luis Aguilar put this in the rundown, so it must be true. <laughs> Phil Neville said, um, Inter Miami have a friendly coming up against Barcelona. You know, these European clubs are starting yep. to come here again for preseason and playing these exhibition games, are gonna, and Barcelona are going to play Inter Miami. And Phil Neville said it's the biggest match in Inter Miami history. Now, you played in these games back in the day, sure. and maybe in your time when you're trying to promote the league, but in 2022, shouldn't we be past this if a, an MLS club looking at a game like this as being something monumental for them? Yeah, it's, you know, read the room. And maybe he is reading the room from a Miami perspective and the, the bigger picture. Keep in mind, this is an Inter-Miami, David Beckham's Inter-Miami team that has been nothing but failure on the field, Okay. Yeah, I think that they've resonated off the field. Uh, I think that there is awareness. I love the pink. So the appearance and the optics of a pink team, I think is their most successful part of David Beckham's Inter Miami. But for the most part, it has been a failure uh, on the field. When you look at this, look, I get it. I understand why playing Barcelona is yet another opportunity to bring people into your Inter-Miami tent, whether it's the actual stadium, uh, right now the temporary stadium that you are in, and you introduce and you taste test the brand. I, I, I understand all of that. But 
when you say something like this, I think it's a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face of the league and your team. And you are, for the most part, you have been signed and you are paid to be successful in Major League Soccer. And that is and should be your priority. It doesn't mean you can't celebrate a game like this. It doesn't mean you can't even talk about the wonderful impact and effects that it can have on it. But to say that this is the biggest game in Inter Miami's history, I think that that, I think that that devalues the games that have come before. And you have had games in the past where had you won those games, you possibly could have gone to a playoffs. Had you won those games, you possibly could have gone to an MLS Cup. And you didn't. Those were big games. This is an exciting, big game. But to say it's your biggest game in Miami's history, I just think that it you're smarter than that. Or maybe you're not. And we'll talk a lot about Barcelona in our upcoming transfer segment. Right. Um, but yeah, last note on MLS, uh, Philadelphia uh, beat New England. Three straight wins for them. They're atop the Eastern Conference. We mentioned LAFC atop the West. So they came yeah. back. They were down one nothing, yeah. and uh, New England is struggling right now. The, uh, the Bruce Arena magic may have worn off there for now. You never uh, put it past him to figuring uh, figuring it out right now. So Philadelphia sitting at the top <coughs> of the uh, of the East. Congratulations uh, to them. They continue to truck along, and uh, and that's important. You know, somebody uh, somebody asked me, uh, and we'll we'll end this here. But somebody asked me on Twitter. I think it was this morning. Uh, I want to make sure I have this. Was asking me about the Moneyball clubs that we have in Major League Soccer, and I think Philadelphia while a big market operates more like a small market team. And the money ball comes from the Oakland A's and, and that whole concept of doing more with less. And, and this person, like others out there, was perturbed that a team like Philadelphia or other teams that are doing more with less aren't getting more love and attention. And, you know, there's a reason. We, we, there's a reason why we talk about the super clubs. There's a reason why we talk about the big name clubs. There's a reason why we talk about the, the major market clubs. Not that what others are doing isn't, isn't fun or interesting or cool, but the reality is that big clubs and clubs, whether they're big or not, but clubs spending money oftentimes is more interesting, is more no noteworthy, uh, and ultimately is more consequential to what is going on. Spending money is associated with ambition, it is associated with quality, and it is associated with power. And so those that do spend money, by the way, win or lose, case in point, the Los Angeles Galaxy, they often get the most attention. That is, that just, that doesn't always, uh, that's not necessarily that it applies only to soccer. It actually applies to a lot of things in, in life out there. And so if, if it's Philadelphia or any other team that's not getting the attention that you want, you know, that's the reason why. You may not like it, but that's just the, uh, the nature of what's going on. And don't start me with uh, youth development. Youth development is not interesting or sexy for most people out there. All right. And if you're going to hang your hat on that, fine. But it doesn't mean that everybody's going to uh, going to talk about it. So there you go. Truth hurts. Um, anything else, Mossy? That is it. Uh, do we do we hurt anybody's feelings that we, that we didn't get to uh, anybody here that uh, is going to be angry? Let's see. Uh, let me just go through really quick. Austin, well done. Second place. There you go. Salt Lake uh, punching above your weight at third place. There. Uh, you didn't mention Montreal beating Toronto one nil or Minnesota beating DC United two nil. I think those are the two games. Well, so why couldn't Wayne Rooney, who was upstairs uh, during that game in Minnesota, why couldn't he coach the team? Never under, I never understood that. If, you, if you're named the head coach, what are you waiting for? It's not as if you have to get into shape. It's not as if, you know, he's, he's out of form. You're the coach. You're the new coach of the team. Go coach the team. I'll never forget it. I think it was Andre Villas-Boas when he took over Zenit many years ago. They had this like brutal stretch, uh, the schedule, and he told them, I need several games to observe from high above. And, and he, he handpicked when the, when the schedule That's got lame. easier. Like, Tell you, I'll start coaching you then. <laughs> That's lame. I mean, I know it's strategic and all that, but I think I just think that's lame. Come in, coach, coach the damn team. All right. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, oh, we'll take a look around the rest of the world because there's all sorts of stuff that's going on there. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. Lots of transfer news, including uh, the big one that has been talked about but uh, finally came to fruition. Robert Lewandowski going to Barcelona, the team without any money or means to bring in anybody, (laughs) is bringing in Robert Lewandowski to score the goals. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about Barcelona's financial situation, the degree to which they seem to be mortgaging the future to win one transfer window and the problems that could uh, bring about later on. But I do want to put that aside for one week and just focus on the actual on-field ramifications of this move, both for Barcelona and for Bayern Munich. I was asked about this on Twitter, and I said, this move in one fell swoop might give us two title races next season, one between Real Madrid and Barcelona and the other between Bayern and Dortmund. Let's start in Spain. I know it's a lot of different players and they're going to have to mesh, but I will say Barcelona are putting together a pretty good roster on paper, so much for this being a long-term rebuild. I mean, they've also finalized a deal for Rafinha last week and re-signed Usman Dembele. So you're looking at an attack with Lewandowski leading the way, Obama Young as his backup. You've got out wide players like Rafinha, Dembele, Ferran Torres, Ansu Fati, if he can stay healthy. Midfield with Busquets, Gavi, Pedri, uh, Kessie, who they brought in. As of now, Frankie de Jong, who's refusing to leave. That's the one concession they've made to their financial issues. They're trying to sell Frankie de Jong, but he's refusing to leave. <laughs> More on that in a minute. The back line, uh, they brought in Christensen. They're still trying to get Koundé, Aspiliqueta. When the dust settles here, they might actually have a team that I think can compete with Real Madrid this upcoming season, which would be uh, oh, absolutely. pretty interesting. Oh, I, I, I think from a competitive standpoint, this is a team that I want to watch. This is a team that very quickly, I think, could, you know, they talk about a return to the top. Yeah, I I have, you know, I have no problem saying that uh, that that is is going to happen. I think it's going, and, you know, the the Lewandowski move, as you mentioned, it it provides, obviously, an incredible goal score, but it also, it provides a way to play and a a change, if you will, of the way that they are going to play. Because, you know, I think we talked about this last week in the same way that uh, Erlen Holland changes fundamentally the way that Manchester City is going to play. Um, Lewandowski does the, uh, does the same thing. Of those two, who do you think ultimately, I mean, it's subjective, but is more successful come the end of the year? Wait, Lewandowski and... Erlen Holland. Oh, Erlen Holland. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, the situation he's walking into there at Manchester City, to me, that's an absolute can't miss. Um, Lewandowski okay. at his age, switching leagues after a long time, and Bundesliga, the there are some question marks there. I have none with Erlen Holland okay. at Manchester All right. City. All right. Uh, All now, right. skipping over to Germany, um, I don't think this is great for the Bundesliga. You lose your biggest established star. I know Erlen Holland left this summer too, but they've grown accustomed to that sort of departure, a young player using the Bundesliga as a stepping stone for a couple of years to then go to uh, the Premier League or even a bigger league. Um, in Lewandowski's case, he's been the face of that league right. for uh, a decade now. But the positive side of it is we've all dinged the Bundesliga for being predictable, a one-team league. We know who's going to win it every year. And now you wonder if taking Lewandowski off Bayern uh, coupled with the moves that Dortmund have made this summer, uh, if maybe we have a real race on our hands this upcoming season. There are different schools of thought on that. I saw Keith Costigan tweeting excitedly about the potential of this Bayern team. And it's true, they've had a good summer otherwise. They brought in Sadio Mane, they brought in Gravenberch, Mats Rawi, uh, Matthias De Litt, um, and So who's you know, playing that position? Well, a lot of people think it's going to be sort of a more versatile attack with Mane, and uh, Gnabry and Coman and Sané, and that that actually fits Nagelsmann's system better. And so people think, look, Bayern are not a one-man team. They were great before Lewandowski, and they're just going to keep rolling without him. While there's another school of thought that we sometimes take for granted, that safety blanket of having a center forward scoring 30 goals a season and how many points that's worth, and that, you know, it's, it's not going to be quite the same. Everyone you just named, though, is, is around that position. Yeah, they, so... don't, they don't have a, a true center forward. Now, the guy that would love to fill that void is Cristiano Ronaldo. It's become abundantly clear that Bayern would be his preferred choice. He's doing everything he can to force that move, but Bayern don't seem that keen on it. Let's say they don't sign him and they go into the season without an out-and-out center forward and, again, relying on Sadio Mane to play that role and sometimes Serge Gnabry and kind of piece it together like that. Could that be an Achilles heel? They've grown so used to having that out-and-out center forward. They should have bought Castellanos. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, you, you wonder, you know, and Dortmund, I've talked about their summer. They lose Holland, but they brought in Sebastian Haller to replace him, who I think will do well. Karim Adayemi improved at the back with Sula and Schlotterbeck. So 
Um, you know, they've held on to Jude Bellingham. If Roy stays fit, if Gio uh, can get himself healthy, I, I, I think they have a team where, I mean, looking at both rosters side by side, we could have a race on our hands. I mean, okay, so, think? but I know that this is a fundamental change when you lose Lewandowski, but I, we've also, I've seen this movie before with, with us where it comes to the beginning of the season and we say, oh, now it's going to, it's, it's, it's on. Now it's really going to happen. And it, it peters out and it, and it doesn't ultimately. I mean, ultimately... Bayern Munich, even with the loss of Lewandowski, has plenty of talent, like you mentioned, plenty of depth, and they are, and they've added pieces, not necessarily in that number nine position. So, but you think this is actually going to create what we've been kind of wishing for for a number of years now? I do. Like I said, I stand by what I said on okay. Twitter. I do think this, in one fell swoop, this Lewandowski move has given us two title races to look forward to okay. next season. I love it. Spain. I love it, my friend. Well, that would be wonderful. That um, would be wonderful. Now, on Rafinha, I do want to put a code on this whole situation because it dragged on for weeks. Um, Chelsea offered Leeds more money. They reached an agreement with Leeds. They thought they were going to get him, but um, Rafinha was able to drag it out until Barcelona somehow raised the funds to offer a comparative price, and then Leeds were willing to send him where he wanted to go. Arsenal were also willing to offer uh, more money than Barcelona ultimately ended up paying. Here's what I'll say about that. Um, a couple of years ago, I was listening to a uh, Brazilian podcast interview with Allison's agent, and he was recounting um, how in the summer of 2018, when Allison ultimately signed with Liverpool, uh, before he did so, there were rumblings that Real Madrid might make an offer. And the agent said he was praying that Real Madrid didn't make an offer because he wanted Allison to go to Liverpool. He felt like that was the best move. He could see what Klopp was building. And at Liverpool, he would walk in to replace Karius and to be the right. starter, while at Real Madrid, he'd be battling Kaylor Navas, who had just won so he knew it was, it was a better titles in a row. It's a better but option. He knew that had Real Madrid made an offer, Allison would have wanted to go there. Right. Why? Because he said Brazilians are wholly incapable of turning down Real Madrid and Barcelona. And that's just, I know it frustrates Premier League folk, but that's just something that they have not been able to puncture a hole into. Uh, they've made great strides in South America in the last 15 years. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when there were actually very few Brazilians in the Premier League. Uh, they would avoid it like the plague. They would flock to Spain and Italy because it was felt that they would adapt better there culturally and in terms of the style of football, the weather and all the rest. Um, and now that's changed. I mean, they're, they're, the Premier League is loaded with Brazilians. It's become by far the most relevant league in terms of the national team. In Chichi's 26-man squad for the World Cup, I bet you half the players will be Premier League players. Yeah, but, but how many of them are iconic? Though? Well, that's it. But I think when you go lower down the food chain, if it's between playing for a mid-table Premier League team or a mid-table anywhere else, you take the Premier League. But at the very top of that food chain, the top player still prefers playing for Barcelona or Real Madrid than any of those Liverpool, City, United, Chelsea. And I know that bugs I don't think Premier it's League as, folk. This is just Brazilians, though. I think that when Real Madrid, even with the struggles of Barcelona and, and you know the, the stuff that's gone on, I still think when that call comes from Real Madrid or, or Barcelona, there are a lot of players, regardless of nationality, that have a hard time saying no to that. It's interesting. Earlier this summer, there were, for a few days there, there were stories that Real Madrid might uh, pursue Gabriel Jesus, but it was contingent on Vinicius getting a Spanish passport, which would free uh -huh. up a non-EU spot. And once they found out that wasn't going to happen, they pulled out of the race. So it just became about a bunch of different Premier League clubs, and he chose Arsenal. And Arsenal fans have been puffing their chest out about that. But I will say this to Arsenal fans, had Real Madrid been a viable option, he would have gone there, even though it would have completely undercut his reasons for leaving Manchester City in the first place, because, you know, he wants to leave to, to play a start every week and play as a center forward. He <laughs> wouldn't have had that at Real Madrid. It would have been the same situation at City because they have Benzema there. So he would have played more as a winger and kind of been a rotation player. But it's Real Madrid. He it's, would not have been able to say no to Real Madrid. It's a prestige thing. It's, uh, yeah, so I get it's, it. it's, it's human. It's, it's an interesting I, dynamic. But it is interesting to hear that story from, a, from an agent's perspective. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because there is that cachet that comes with signing with a big name, and that's always going to be on your resume going forward. And there is value to that. But from his perspective saying, God, I hope Real Madrid doesn't come in and <laughs> screw this up because he's not going to be able to talk him out of it. Oh, man. All right. Uh, uh, what else? One, one American note, um, Gabriel Slonina, it, it does sound like he's headed to Chelsea, but would then be loaned back to Chicago. Yeah. Um, so, which might be, I think, the, the, the best situation for all involved. I mean, we, we're seeing this on a consistent basis with, with the amount and the depth of talent that the U.S. is starting to produce. They're looking to get ahead and they're looking to buy early and to hedge their bets to a certain extent. When it comes to Chelsea, this is also nothing new. I mean, we saw Matt Miazga. So ultimately, again, 
the headline is relative to Chelsea, but who knows if these guys ever end up really being Chelsea players. Yes, they on the, and just because you're on the books doesn't mean you're actually a player for that team. And, you know, they, they're just looking at where he is right now, extrapolating it out and hedging the bet here that he's going to be worth that much more. And he's already in a good position. They were going to loan him out anyway. Uh, why not have him stay in a place where he is obviously healthy, he's going to start on a continual basis, and if they are confident that he is getting not just the reps, but the quality that is going to improve him, then let it ride. A couple of other big picture transfer notes. Um, a lot of big center back moves. Um, it all started with Antonio Rudiger moving from Chelsea to Real Madrid, and now to replace him, Chelsea have signed Koulibaly from Napoli, who I like a lot. They've also been linked to Kimpembe from PSG. Also, Jules Koundé, who Barcelona are after as well. Skriniar from Inter Milan looks like is going to go somewhere. I mentioned Bayern Munich have signed Matthias De Litt from Juventus for a big fee, 80 million euros, which for Bayern is a huge outlay. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting, this sort of center back uh, merry-go-round. Uh, and I will say on De Litt, uh, both Matthias De Litt and Frankie de Jong were, were big stars on that really fun Ajax team that made it all the way to the Champions League semis in 2019. Should have gone to the final uh, devastating elimination to Tottenham. Oh. Lucas Mora going nuts in that second <laughs> leg. Um, and then that summer, they got big moves. Frankie went to Barcelona and Matthias De Litt went to Juventus. And I have to say, I don't think either one of those guys lit the world on fire. And I'm surprised at how high their stock still is. Uh, Matthias De Lint moving to Bayern for 80 million euros. And Frankie de Jong, he's the only one holding this up. Manchester United are willing to buy him for 85 million euros. Ooh. And Barcelona would love to make that deal to get some money back, but he doesn't want to leave. Um, but still, the fact that United are willing to pay that fee and, and Bayern paid the fee they did for De Lint, it really shows you that I guess the, the, the feeling is that those guys just went to the wrong places, but that there's still major talents that are worth investing in. So I found that kind of interesting. But yeah, that, the center back stuff, everything Barcelona are doing, it's suddenly turning into a very interesting summer. And we still have this Cristiano Ronaldo situation hanging over everything, which I, I have to say, no disrespect to him, but it's, it's getting a little pathetic because it doesn't seem like anybody <laughs> wants this guy. And he's, he's just out there begging somebody to, to take him every day. You re read about a different club, but it's, it's, it's the Ronaldo camp reaching out to that club not the other way around. So I don't know. What a weird situation this has turned into. So so you feel bad for him? I don't feel you bad don't feel for him. I, I just, it's, it is it is a bit sad for a, a great player like that. To, and and I don't think the, I mean, you know you're going to have to pay him money. You're, you're going to have to pay him a good chunk of money. But it, I don't think it's prohibitive, the amount of money. I think it's really based on, do we want to deal with this? And whatever it is. And But it's a little unfair to characterize him in that way relative to Manchester United. He actually has been one of the functioning pieces, if you will. I know that he brings baggage. I know that you have to adjust to play with someone like Cristiano Ronaldo. But by all accounts, he's been relatively good off the field. And on the field, he's just continued to score goals. He might not be your, your, cup, of, your, your cup of tea, but again... If he can continue to do that, do you think ultimately this uh, ends up with him going to Germany? No, I no. think he's going to end up staying at Manchester United. Okay. How, does he does he play? Does he? What do they say? Pro the, throw the toys out of the, the pram? What's the what's the thing they say? What's that? Baby with the bathwater. Baby. Well, no, no. Throw the throw the toys out of the pram. I think that's what it is. Yeah, you get, you know you have a, a fit like a child or something like that because he's not because if he's not playing consistently. No, no. It, it, if he doesn't get his move, he'll go back to United. He'll suck it up. He'll perform. And I think he'll play a fair amount. I don't think Ten Hag is going to cast him aside. Okay. So. All right. Cool. Cool. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right. Let's take another quick break. And when we come back, oh, it's time for Ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. All right. Welcome back. Time for uh, Ask Alexi. Uh, you use that hashtag out there. Or don't. But it just makes it a little easier when you actually do use that hashtag. Or you can... Uh, Call us on our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. What do the people want to know this week, Mossy? First up, at QSLADEC5 asks, Dark Horse to go far in the World Cup. Uh, now, you responded to this question on Twitter with Denmark or Mexico. Yeah, and they're, they are a little bit different. I think that a lot of people would, would look to Denmark uh, as a possible dark horse, and they are on the 
what do they say? The ascend, the ascendery or whatever, the, uh, the ascension or you know, whatever, the ascendance. Um, as opposed to Mexico, which we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, here, it, it, there's there's some problems, I think, or some anticipated problems with uh, with with the whole program, but certainly with the uh, the men's national team, in that they don't look to be firing on all cylinders. I think that makes them dangerous. I I back Mexico to rise to the occasion. I back Mexico when people are doubting them to do some good things. And this whole Tata thing, let's, let's spin it forward here because there was a, uh, um, a culling of the, of the herd. There was a, uh, a massive firing when it comes to the, the, the uh, Mexican Soccer Federation. And to be fair, when it comes to the, the women's national team, uh, which, which didn't qualify, when it comes to youth national teams, which are bombing out, uh, and to a certain extent, the uh, the full national team, there have been problems. And so coaches were fired, uh, sporting directors, multiple positions, multiple people were fired. The one person that was not fired was Tata Martino. And I don't think that that should necessarily come as any surprise. And I don't think that it has to do with how much money he's making. Mexico, as a federation, has shown time and time again, they will pay people out and they will they will fire people at the smallest uh, possibility of failure. I do think that, well, I think he has supporters still within the, the uh, Federation. And I think in general, people feel that he ultimately is going to be judged by the World Cup. And that's where he is going to come good. Get that, uh, what is it, the uh, Quinto uh, Partido or whatever, the, uh, the, the, the game that for so long they have wanted to get to and get over that hump when it comes to not getting out of the group, not just going to the, six, the round of 16, but getting past that. And that is his job. I think that he's actually going to do it come November and December. But it was an interesting last couple of weeks when it comes to the uh, Mexican Soccer Federation and the angst that it has produced within the Mexican soccer community out there as to, we talked last week about the gap and how big that gap uh, ultimately is right now. But the U.S. is heading in one direction, and I think that direction is up and in a positive direction. And at least the perception right now is the Mexican Soccer Federation is in disarray, as is its game on the field. Yeah, U.S. fans on Twitter are very cocky as far as this rivalry goes, really uh, taunting Mexico over their struggles. It would be pretty amazing if the U.S. crashes out on the group stage and Mexico gets to the quarterfinals uh, could happen. I mean, this sport has a way of turning narratives on its head. We all think the U.S. is up, Mexico's down, and then watch that happen. And yeah, I mean, to your point about Denmark, semifinalists at the Euros, uh, impressive qualifying campaign. I'm wondering if they even still qualify as a dark horse. Um, in terms of their historical pedigree, they do. It would be pretty amazing if Denmark were to get to a semifinal final of a World Cup and, and even win it would be mind-blowing. But um, Would but, you have uh, somebody else in mind? Uh, Senegal yeah, is a... That's the other one like that a lot it. of people yeah. bring up. Yeah, a lot of people are bringing them up. So I, I want to try to find somebody that nobody's talking about going into the World Cup. So I'll have to think on it some more, but, you know. Right. Well, uh, you, we were talking the other day that you're reading a lot of books in preparation for the World Cup. You're reading a lot of books about the Middle East and stuff like that. So you're actually interested in a lot of the teams, the Saudi Arabias and the Irans and the, uh, and the uh, well, Qatars. Yeah, I, it, I'll, I'll give out the book recommendation here. It's called Black Wave. It's about... It's, it's not about sports. It's about you know, politics and, and it's uh, about Iran and Saudi Arabia and the 40 year rivalry that's defined the Middle East. Uh, the thesis of the book is that those two nations have carried on sort of a cold war in the last 40 years and each trying to export their brand of Islam to all these other countries in the region. Great book, I learned so much about the Middle East. And yeah, just thinking ahead to the fact that I'm gonna be there in Qatar later this year and that both those nations are in it along with Qatar. Yeah, it, it just gives it a whole another layer to sort of looking at those teams' performances and, and the geopolitical yeah. implications of one performing better than the other. So Look yeah, at I mean, you. Not to go it shouldn't surprise me. That. It shouldn't surprise <laughs> me at all that, uh, that you are a fountain uh, of information and you're just pouring in more and more each and every day. I love it. Uh, what else? Um, next up, some guy named Alexi Lalas asks... <laughs> all right. Um, We're yeah, really we scraping took, the we, bottom <laughs> of the barrel here. <laughs> took one of you. Yeah. 
if the EPL had a draft today that equally distributed all current players regardless of salary, who would be the most successful team at the end of the season? In other words, in an EPL of real competitive on-field parity, who wins and why? This was your attempt to puncture the mystique of Pep and Klopp. Let's see if everybody had the same talent across the board, who the real geniuses would be. I would, first off, I would pay money, and I bet you people around the world would pay a tremendous amount of money if you actually did it. I mean, we've all been there on the, the playground, right? Where you, you divvy up the teams, and you have two captains or whatever, and they pick one after one back and forth, and then... Theoretically, it's a much more balanced and fair type of competition. I would just love to see. And, you know, for for those, this this was just an exercise. And for the, some people came back and said, well, you know, what's the order of it? And all that. Look, just don't don't be like that. All right. You know what I'm you know what I'm saying here. And I think it is worth thinking about. Would it ever happen? No. But I would love if right now, when all these teams are together, everybody came together to see what the strategy would be from coaches that we know and coaches that maybe we don't know a whole lot. First off, there's a strategy in who you pick. If, I mean, if, you're, if Jurgen Klopp looked out at all the talent that exists in the EPL and he had a pick and he could only pick one player to start off with, who's he picking? He's picking a goalkeeper. He's picking a goal scorer. Is it someone from his team? Is it someone from, God forbid, Man City? Uh, not God forbid, it, it, it could be. So that that got my wheels spinning. But yes, what it comes down to is, and I am not negating how important and unique the skill uh, and the tools of coaching an elite team, coaching a super club is. And there are coaches that are made for that, and there are coaches that are not made for that. And some thrive within that, and some, some don't. But this concept of coaching players up I think it has unfortunately been lost with time. First question any manager will ask nowadays is, how much money do I have? How much room do I have to bring people in or to move people out? And I know I, I, I ask any coach, they will tell you I'm only as good as my players. Fair enough, but the whole point of coaching is you are being paid because we believe that you, more than anybody else out there, can take what we have and make them better collectively and make them better individually. And the ones that we put on a pedestal, for the most part, are relative to the big money and the big winning super clubs out there, your, your peps and your clops. I'm not saying that given this circumstance and given this exercise, that pep and clop wouldn't be good. As a matter of fact, I, I do think that they would be good, but it is a little different. And maybe what we would see is the great coaches, the quote unquote great co coaches would still be very good. But some of the coaches that we maybe underappreciate now that are punching above their weight, given that that parity and it recognize that it's manufactured, we'd actually come to value and respect that much more for their ability. It's like, it's, it's like a race, a race car where everybody has the exact same car. So it all has the same capabilities in terms of speed and turning and stopping and doing all that. Then it really comes down to the driver. Well, I want to see what these drivers ultimately have if given relatively the same car. And we'll never see that, but there is an assessment of these coaches that we put on a pedestal to be done in that crazy, <laughs> you know, romantic type of uh, situation that will never come that I think is of value and would be interesting. Now, I agree with you. I will say of the big clubs in the Premier League, I think Liverpool would suffer the least because although they've spent increasingly more money here in recent years, I think Klopp has demonstrated an ability to coach, coach up up. players and turn non-superstars into superstars and find good value in the market. Uh, Darwin Nunez notwithstanding, I hope they helped, they kept the receipt on that one. <laughs> I, I've, I've been overly impressed with his preseason performances. But teams like Brentford and teams like Brighton and, you know, those mid-level mid -level teams, we might see that given this opportunity, the, the coaches would look different. And so whether it's, uh, was it Graham Potter and Thomas Frank and these types of, of coaches out there, they, they might look very, very different in this, uh, in this light. And I would love to see it. Uh, I would love to see what maybe the redefinition of what a good coach is. 
we'll end with this one. Uh, Michael asks, White Claw, really? I bet you drank Zima in the 90s, too. This was in reference to a picture you posted of you drinking White Claw. Uh, yes. Have you had uh, the Claw, Mossy? I have not. You've never had a White Claw? I've probably had it in my life, but I don't drink it regularly. It's not in my regular rotation. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, this is, this, this is going to sound like a confessional, but it, it shouldn't be. I, uh, I like White Claw. I have for a number of years. And if there is an element of confession <laughs> in that statement, it's simply, it's simply based on the, uh, <laughs> the, and you will know this, the scorn from many out there. And by the way, m- mostly men that the, the flavored hard seltzer uh, that, um, you know, the, the reaction that White Claw seems to elicit. Keep in mind, uh, this person mentioned Zima. I have lived through the eras of the 80s wine cooler, your Bartles and James and that kind of stuff. I've lived through the 90s Zima craze. And I lived through the the aughts uh, hard lemonade phase. You'll remember all of that. And so this this ongoing search uh, for an alternative to you know, the, the wines and the beers or the, you know, the liquor, it just, it, it rolls on with, uh, with each new generation. Um, I don't know if the seltzer wars are coming to an end here and we'll probably move on to something else. But until then, I remain firmly in the camp of White Claw and I've tried them all. And there are so many out there. I'm sure that people know there's your, your Trulies and your Bon Vies and your Ranch Waters, um, what other ones? Uh, Henry's. And, and then, you know, the big country, like Bud Light have their own and Corona have their own and Nude. And, you know, list goes on and on and on. And what I have found is that White Claw, and, and by the way, Black Cherry in particular. And no, I'm not sponsored. This is not anything. This is not a sponsor of the show. I'm just telling you why uh, I enjoy the Claw, if you will. Uh, I find it to be the cleanest and the lightest and there, and also, and this is important because sometimes you sacrifice this, the tastiest of all of them. A lot of the other ones are, are, are too sweet or they're trying too hard. So yeah, I am a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of White Claw. And I know some of the, uh, actually, you know what I should do? Hold on. I, I think I can do this in real time here. Uh, so whenever I post about White Claw, inevitably I get back these, these responses. Let's see a couple of them. How about here? Um, you might have to bleep this out here. So, you know, there's the usual hand over your man card. Um, there's one, oh, you, you and my wife like the same drink. So that's just to give you an idea of just the venom when it comes to people, when they hear that somebody drinks White Claw. And a lot of it's machismo. And like I said, a lot of it comes from, from guys out there. And, and I get it to a, cert, to a certain extent. But, you know, you drink what you like. I, I also... I'm uh, and well known for my love of a nice buttery Chardonnay, but that's a different segment. It's a different uh, discussion. I'll, I'll save that for uh, for something else. So uh, I remain a fervent and proud drinker of White Claw. Long live White Claw, um, and uh, I will I will fight you for that. And until you know, I will I will continue to gallantly fight the slings and arrows that are out there when it comes to White Claw. There, that was a pretty passionate defense of White Claw. If we don't get a sponsorship out of this, uh, what the hell are we doing here, right, Mossy? Absolutely. All right, good. Anything else? Uh, That is it. All right. uh, uh, We've come to the end of the show here, and we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I will give you my one for the road. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. It's time for my uh, one for the road. At the end of each and every show, I give you the uh, the one for the road. Uh, Mossy, remind the folks again how we started the show. I think last week because you are a foodie uh, in the in the best sense, and I, I take a lot of my cues from you. And you are always very good at not only recommending television and movie uh, shows out there, but also eateries, if you will. Remind the people where you went last week. I mentioned that for a friend's birthday. Uh, I went to a restaurant in downtown LA called Bestia, which is a famous Italian restaurant. I've always wanted to go, never had gone, and it lived up to the hype. It was absolutely phenomenal. Well, uh, the hype, I I will be the judge if it lifts up to the hype because I am heading out there tonight, all right? As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, later on in the week, you will find dropping into your feed an interview with uh, Greg Berhalter, the head coach of the U.S. men's national team. So uh, we we thought, listen, let's... uh, Let's, let's go to dinner and let's take him out someplace good. And immediately 
this is what came to mind. And so we were lucky enough to be able to get in there. So while, you know, while hanging out and, and talking to Greg Berhalter is, is all f- fine and well, I'm really going for the food and I'm really excited about that. And so we'll ask him about that on our show. Speaking of that, uh, you, will he- you will be hearing this, most of you will be hearing this before um, the show a- actually comes out. Uh, you probably won't be able to get in questions, but we're going to try to cover as many different things as possible. And we have taken you into account out there in terms of social media and things that you talk about and, and questions that you ask, whether we've used them on the show. So there's no way we can cover everything, but I am going to try to uh, to do that with my good friend Mossy when we interview him here. When it comes to the uh, the actual um, Bestia experience, do you have any recommendations before I head out? Well... I was with a big group, so we did a family style thing. They ordered lots of dishes and and brought them all out, and everybody shared. So yeah, I love the duck. I love the branzino. There were multiple pasta dishes that I liked, but really every, bone, the bone marrow, excellent. Yep, bone marrow has already been uh, brought to our attention. As has the what was the other one? It was something about the neck. Uh, she left. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, there was something about it, uh, something out there, but it, it seems to be getting rave reviews everywhere we go. Listen, last thing that I partook in that had been receiving rave reviews was Top Gun Maverick. That lived up to the hype. So let's see if uh, Bestia is that, what, is that what it's called? Bestia. Bestia lives up to the the hype, and. We'll talk about that next week on the uh, on the show, or actually, we'll talk about it with Greg Berhalter in the interview because we want to get his verdict when it comes to something like that. We, these are the hard hitting types of questions that we are going to have for Greg Berhalter when we. Uh, we'll, we'll ask him about Bestia, and if we have time, John Brooks. <laughs> uh, priorities, uh, priorities. Exactly, my friend. Anything? Uh, anything else? That is it. All right. It's been a, a fun and long day. As I mentioned, uh, three different pods dropping this week. Right now you are listening to this, which dropped on Tuesday. On Wednesday, our preview, a year out of the Women's World Cup, will drop into your feed. And then on Thursday, as we mentioned, an interview with U.S. Men's National Team coach Greg Berhalter. So check out all of those different things. It's been uh, It's been fun doing those, and I'm looking forward to doing some of those other ones as we start to you know, increase the content out there going forward. Uh, I will see you again next week. Uh, You will see us and hear us again, same time, same place next week here on the State of the Union. Continue to send uh, in your questions uh, using the hashtag Ask Alexi and all the social media platforms out there. Continue to send us questions uh, and or comments uh, on our uh, podcast hotline, which again is 657-549-2297. That's the State of the Union podcast hotline, 657-549-2297. We will see you again next week. And until then, and as always... Size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.